So, yep. Yeah. All right, again, well, welcome. My name is uh, Dr. Martin Giles. You can just say, hey, doc. No, I mean, <laughs> I always tell people, you know, because it's kind of strange when you get your PhD. It's prestigious, but then I say, I, I, yeah, I'm a doctor, but I, I have no patients and no office hours, so. <laughs> which is a double entendre, right? <laughs> so I'm gonna talk about, I mean, I'm a physical oceanographer. I do uh, geophysical fluid dynamics, work on physics stuff, you know, dealing with the oceans. But another thing that we work with, we work with uh, Pat Cayuse, which is a NOAA grant to uh, produce what we call, I think we wanna call it value added products for, um, for our base, which could be both commercial, governmental, and, and the general public. So the ocean observing systems were designed to be enhancements to things we could do in science that help NOAA, um, you know, like instead of just the weather service predicting a storm or something, maybe we can add, we can add some ability to, um, you know, influence shipping, influence your experience at the beach, influence tourism. So. That was this this project and the stuff we'll be talking about is under that grant. So if anyone didn't have a background of what PACAIUS is. And what I'm gonna specifically talk about is sea level rise and inundation. So we developed a very short term inundation prediction product that gives you about four or five days uh, advance warning for certain types of inundation. And it's something new and, and, and interesting. And then that's been being developed for the last four or five years. And, and I'll talk a little about how that fits in, but also I'll talk in general about uh, what the impacts are of sea level rise. Uh, a lot of people are concerned about it, obviously. It's in the news. There's a lot of politics involved. There's a lot of people's um, maybe conceptions or misconceptions, but hopefully I can clear up some of that stuff uh, with this presentation. At least I hope that you'll enjoy that. So to start with, uh, the, the planet Earth doesn't particularly care too much about humans in terms of geologic time scale, right? We're, we're, on, we're new on the scene and our impact on geologic fluctuations is minimal. So with that as a starting point, we'll move ahead from you know, millions of years to we're going to talk in tens of thousands of years. So that brings us into the scope of human time scales. So that's what m most of the things I'm gonna focus on are, are human time scales, because that's us and sea level rise is gonna impact us. And so we need to have a kind of a idea of what does that mean? How has it impacted us in the past? How will it impact us in the future? And what does that mean to our generation right now? So for instance, uh, the last major glaciation was about 30,000 years ago. So. That was when the sea level was much lower than today. Like, way down. All of Hanuma Bay would have been dry land. Could have walked all the way out and gone fished off the end. You know? So, so we're gonna we're gonna start from that point, but we won't dwell on it. So that's that's about the beginning of kind of human cultural history. Like you can go to caves in France and find a reed that's got notches in it that they think is a flute or something, right? So this is the beginning of, of what we would consider the impact of, of humans from sea level. Then we'll, we'll move ahead to ancient history and specifically this period from 16,000 to 11,000 years. And then we'll talk about modern history in the current day. And then we'll look at, uh, you know, what's, what's gonna happen in the future? What's for sure gonna happen? What's possible to happen and what's um, you know, the possibilities. So with that time scale in mind, you can look at this chart and we have uh, time on the bottom, years before the present, coming up to present day at the right hand edge. This is that glaciation period we were talking about. So 30,000 years ago, the sea level was 100 meters below what it is today. So at the advent of kind of human history, the sea level was way below. So that's that's odd, that's pretty interesting. Um, it's, and, and we don't even think about what does that mean. And these are very short geologic time scales. I mean, we're talking about like, the this island we're on is 2.4 million years old, right? So 
and you go up French frigate shoals and stuff, and it's like six million years old. So the Hawaiian chain is is that kind of uh, geologic time scale is much much longer than what we're looking at here. So this is these are kind of these are short time scales. And then also just to to keep in the in your note, uh, the last major warming uh, with peak warming levels you can see up here on the far left you know past a hundred thousand years ago um, the little spikes so these aren't like super accurate it's, but people you know can find these out from ancient shorelines and geologic rocks and stuff like that corals and fishes um, but you'll notice that itself is uh what does it say about 15 meters above today's sea level so that's a lot higher than today all like a key be underwater yeah in the airport and everything so we'll move on from there now this i thought was really cool so i'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about uh you know that last glaciation and when it melted so what we're looking at right now is called beringia bering strait this is the land bridge and i find this super interesting because this is a fact that i didn't know so when it cycles back around to right here, this is 21, 20, 19,000 years ago, 18. So that whole area, they're calling kind of step land, like actual more like, like Mongolian steppe or grassland than it's not even, they don't consider it like tundra of today. It was actually kind of like steppe. So, and yet look at this, this is massive. This is from way, way up in the north of Alaska, all the way down to the Aleutian chain. And that was all like where the, where the saber-toothed tigers and the <laughs> and all the all the beasts of the day roamed the land, right? So it wasn't it was this thing that prevented the migration. It wasn't that they couldn't walk across or could walk across. When it goes back to that twenty-one thousand, you'll notice the whole from the Aleutian chain all the way up into Canada up to the top. That's the edge of the glaciation. So you're talking about massive ice fields that block any kind of land movement across. So that's what prevented it. And when that melted, then, well, there's people already there. They move down the coast. They fill up North America, South America. So that's something I learned. <laughs> We're always learning something. None of us are complete experts. So let's look at this. This chart shows the kind of that more recent sea level um, back to that 15,000 years ago. And then now you get the 10,000 years. And you can notice that there's a lot of warming during that time. So this is when the uh, Bering Strait flooded over and people were already into North America. Then you go up into the Holocene and it all tops out. So for the last part of ancient history for humans, we've had very, very stable sea levels. You can see that it's not a, there's hardly any trend. The sea levels have been very stable all the way up to today. And then this is what people talk about kind of, you know, if you've ever seen the, the famous kind of figure, the hockey puck figure, or you know, the day after tomorrow, whatever, all that stuff, that's actually just this tiny little thing right here, right? That hole is right where it says today, just that tiny little bit. And so on a, on a time scale of you know, 10,000 years ago to 10,000 years in the future, um, that's very low impact, not really noticeable. So that, that's just to put things in perspective. So. We have this stable for over recorded history. We got the modern uh, view of Antarctica covered in ice and Greenland covered in ice. And then we have possible maximum sea levels. And you'll notice that Antarctica, even at these kind of possible maximum sea levels, still has a very large uh, amount of ice. So it's, it's really hard to completely melt Antarctica, but that's kind of a, that's another issue. So what is, what, what does 10,000 years ago kind of mean to us? Well, there was less than 10 million people. The entire race was about the population of Paris, right? <laughs> so that's, that's, that puts things in perspective, right? The first appearance of Hale Bop 10,000 years ago, first cultivation, first kind of uh, North American uh, evidence of, you know, society. Whoop, whoop, we hit the wrong button. We've got and this is what I thought was interesting. I didn't realize that that was the time period when New Guinea separated from Australia as well. So the separation in, in the Australian cultures from the Papua New Guinean cultures happened actually way back. And it was because of this, you know, glaciation melt. And also Long Island becomes an island. So, you know, the first peoples that hit Long Island, actually, they just walked right over. They didn't have to swim. Not a problem. 
they didn't need a bridge either. So let's move into a little bit more modern. We're not too worried too much about 10,000 years ago. Uh, what we're worried about is today and what's going to happen to humans in the future. So now we're looking at a temperature record. Now, of course, we didn't have mercury thermometers in all global areas or satellites circling the globe a thousand years ago. So we have to go by kind of, you know, reconstructed signals based on plants or flora and fauna or ice cores. There's a whole bunch of ways to kind of estimate what the temperature was. But so this is kind of a, a, a overlay of different people's reconstructed temperatures. And what I want to what I want to point out is that there is this really interesting medieval warm period right around thousand years ago or the one thousands and so that had a time period when the globe warmed up a little bit and then cooled off a little bit and then they have this thing called the what maybe is the little ice age when things got colder so those are two recent kind of uh, uh, events in our history that we would have a lot more record right so you have you know oral history up to a certain point you've got clear you know, past the 600s, you've got clear written records of many, many things, even some of these signals, you know, maybe not by modern instrumentation, but people were observing what the sea level looked like, what the fish looked like, you know, all sorts of kinds of records now we can bring into the, into the scientific ideas. So during that medieval war period, we bumped up to about 300 million people, which is not even the population of the United States, but still, that's a much more significant global population. Obviously, it has a larger impact. You've got the Vikings settling Greenland, and it's called Greenland because it was green, right? So during that little medieval warm period, the southern ends of Greenland and Newfoundland and stuff and, and Iceland actually had forests and grass, and they weren't covered by ice, and it had a much different climate. Localized regional climate was different than it is today. So... We, we have this strange thing where regional temperatures could be higher in certain areas, but global temperatures may have been much lower than right now today's temperature. So placing a, a, a heavy um, weight on global temperatures uh, is a hard thing to do at this point. It's, it's, a new, it's a new figure and it probably doesn't mean everything that we, we have it mean in like popular uh, science or or even scientific reports. So at the same time, you know, a few little things. First Crusades happened, gunpowder, magnetic compasses. We can sail the seven seas now. So and that's just at that medieval warm period. So now we have some, you know, climate change that starts to impact societal change, and uh, we can move on. Is this the movie? It didn't work. It didn't work. Even after all of that. Is it or not? No, it's not. No? No, I'm going forward or am I pressing the wrong button? Oh, that was me pressing the wrong button, I guess. <laughs> they didn't tell me about this other button. Yeah. <laughs> There's a little heart and I'm supposed to only press the heart and I I didn't press the heart. Okay. My bad on that one. So and this is uh, this is another thing. So this is this is fascinating. This really fascinated me. I didn't know this at all. Um, this is that same medieval warm period, and so this is kind of a you know reconstructed temperature record in that uh, curve on top of the figure, with the air pointing to the medieval warm, and then underneath is another researcher's estimate of catastrophic storm surges in northern Europe. So this would be like a measure of inundation. Now it's not something we can just point to and say it was exactly this, you know, or, you know, typhoon this or inundation that or flooding here. But this is, you know, this in relationship to these other uh, histograms near it shows that during that warming period, there was much more inundation in that region over that century. So that's a fascinating thing to me. And that, you know, I'm not saying whether it is or not an indicator that we'll have a lot more inundation in the future, but clearly if sea level is going to rise, the potential for inundation increases. And this seems to back that up, which I found quite interesting. Press the heart. There we go. Okay, so now we have to talk about it. So I grew up in Alaska. Um, 
just fantastic place to grow up as a kid. Small town, fishing, hunting, best place ever, except for it's dark out all winter long. <laughs> so I didn't know just because I'm a kid growing up there, but everyone that moved there, all my friends, anybody that would move there and come, they're all depressed all winter. I'm like, why are they all depressed? You know, it's because there's no vitamin D, no sunlight. You can drink all the milk you want. It doesn't convert wood. That's a different issue. But so what we're looking at right here, that's Glacier Bay. That's a picture looking down at Glacier Bay. So George Vancouver sailed through the, the uh, archipelago in 1794, came upon Glacier Bay. There's no bay. There's just a 20-mile-long wall of ice. The whole thing, one big glacier. And that's only a little more than 200 years ago. And that was a big glacier, almost a mile thick at its thickest. So we come forward to 1879, and under Muir's expeditions, we found that there was 30 miles of bay at that point in time. So that's a lot of ice melt, yeah? A lot of glaciation just moving out of the way. And I can kind of tell you that it's an interesting figure to put up. This is not in favor of you know climate deniers or not deniers, but no one was driving Suburbans in 1794. So. And we're not even into the industrial age. So societal impact of this last glaciation was severe and, and happening, and it was all a natural thing. So we haven't got to the anthropogenic part yet, right? And yet there's severe changes in certain areas of the globe. So <coughs> regional changes were massive. And so you come there today. Well, it, so it was 1916, too. It had gone all the way into the inlet. So the bay was completely clear. And now you get there, and you can look down the inlets and... Uh, and you have the bay, the inlets, and tidewater glaciers still. But pretty soon, even the tidewater glaciers will be gone. So, and this, this is fascinating. So, where I grew up, I grew up in Juneau, Alaska. I lived out in the valley, which is called the Mendenhall Valley, which is because the Mendenhall Glacier used to be there, right? And where I grew up, you could get out on the deck and you could look out and there's the glacier, right? And so, me and my friends, we would actually go out to the glacier. You could walk up to the glacier. You could scoop ice and put it in your cup and drink it. You could uh, ice climb on the glacier, which we did. You could do all sorts of stuff. And so I found this, was, this was just fascinating. This is 1935 in the Chicago Tribune. And I love this quote. So this father, oops, pressing the wrong button again. Okay. This father Hubbard, who explored some of the ice fields, uh, made these comments, which was really funny. He says, it's losing many miles of its front annually. So they knew over the course of a decade that it was shrinking quite quite rapidly. But they also knew at that point in time that glaciers, they would advance. They're like a river of ice. So they're moving forward. They're also shrinking. And so his comment was he didn't know whether it was going to be permanent shrinking or whether it would grow again. You know, And so even less than 100 years ago, the perception of what's happening was, and I like to use this term, perception of climate change is often heavily influenced by our regional experiences of what we perceive as climate or what's changing around us on a shorter time scale but that's probably not global what's really global to climate change and what defines global climate change i mean if one region changes and another region changes and those are permanent changes i mean those are permanent changes but it may not change the global climate so it's 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 a it's a tricky business so this is just a couple pictures this is a this is the view of my glacier i like to call my glacier because i grew up looking at it every day uh, 1894, there's no lake, and then uh, 2008, there's no glacier. This is all rock. There's no, uh, it's not even at the lake anymore. And when I first remember it, the glacier completely covered the sides of the mountain, and it was all at the lake's edge. And we could actually ice skate out to it when it fr froze over and ski around there. And then uh, by the time I was done with high school, this whole side had become rock and this side had broken through. So it's pretty interesting just to watch this stuff happen right in your own lifespan. So then we just quickly, let's think about what happens in possible future time skills. And I lost a red line here. Very sorry, that's funny. We switched from PowerPoint to whatever I use you know, sometimes. I have on this figure, and for those not watching my uh, laser pointer, I had a red line that would shoot straight up to these black arrows, um, one from Greenland and one from Antarctica. 
And those are kind of points in this kind of hypothetical warming sea level rise curve from this figure. This is a, kind of a modern new um, estimate of what's going to happen. So at this edge right here where the line in the figure turns from blue to red, that's our present day. And then the red shoots off into the future. And we can see on the edge that the top of the graph at 100, that's in centimeters, so that's one meter. And we can go up here and estimate that, or not, that's five meters, three meters? Five meters, so five meters at the top of the graph, so I remember this. So when, when Greenland completely melts right here, if you extended this red line to the tip of the black arrow, that's about the year 2500, and we'd get about six meters of sea level rise, and Greenland have, will have completely melted. So, you know, another 400 years or so, and we'll all go live in Greenland again. And then after that, you shoot up to this end of the tip of the arrow coming off of Antarctica, and you can see that that would be like the year 3000, and you'd get another maybe 20 meters of sea level rise. So within the next millennia, humans will be facing, well, quite a number of changes that will yeah, impact. 20 meters on top of the six with Greenland. Yeah, that's another 20 meters, yeah. And that's not all the ice blocked up in, in Antarctica, but but that's just an estimate of where, and these are really, really rough estimates, you know, so we can't be exacting about these things. So let's talk about what's happening with sea level right now. So sea level trends are a funny thing, and it's hard to talk about global sea level rise. And this is the reason why. On this figure, these are the last best estimates from real data stations showing the change in sea level. So you'll notice, of course, there's a lot of coastal stations. And these are, these are stations that are operated by NOAA or other agencies, so they're very, very accurate. And what I mean by accurate, they actually take in and compensate for the change in the, in the elevation at the station. So they're GPS locked. So these stations will actually rise or fall. And that's why you see this. The major glaciation above Alaska melted. And the major glaciation above Sweden and Norway and Finland melted. And that's the greatest sea level drop because those land masses are still deflecting from the removal of the ice. Those continental margins are still rising because the, all the weight from the ice is gone. And you can imagine if you just kind of put a ping pong ball in your, in your cup of water, when you take your finger off, it pops up. Well, this stuff is popping up. It's just popping up on a geologic time scale, just slowly rising back up. So what do we consider those things as part of this global sea level rise? No, I'm yes, I don't know. And you can imagine, okay, well, if that's rising and the continental shelf outside of it's rising, then the actual volume of the ocean is changing too, right? So I could have sea level rising and falling just by changing the size of the cup. So talking about global sea level rises, it can be really quite tricky when you're talking about just what's happening right now and uh, how's it going to impact you know, society right now. But Barring all of that, you can see that out in the middle of the open ocean and along some of these margins where there's not a lot of geologic motion, like in Africa or in some parts of Europe or along the eastern seaboard or out in the middle of the Pacific, they all have this, you know, green arrow that's slightly up. So that's our current modern day trend in sea level, slowly rising. <coughs> Excuse me, the back where the slide before, down by the Caribbean Sea or the uh, southern coastal areas, is that a pop-up area also? Is that red there for the That's rising faster. Yeah. Oh, rising. Water. Yeah, yeah. Water. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. And can, you can guess why. It's because yeah. the land is sinking, right? Right. So that whole uh, delta region. So in anywhere where you have riverine deltas, right. those are actually subsidence zones, yeah? So you could actually get sea level rising, but really it's the land that's sinking, you know, so. So how far does that um, inundation go? Is it how far the Mississippi area? Well, this is just measuring a trend in sea level, so there's oh, no it's inundation. It's not a geographical map. Of where yeah, this is not an inundation map at all. So this is just, these are just actual locked in stations that have more than, more than 20 years of really reliable data. So this is a trend that's based on very, very, very accurate data. That's 
and then and now what we measure this whole thing we use the satellite so we have a different way of actually measuring but this is a very good thing to show kind of demonstrate why it's such a tricky a tricky little bug so let's look at what sea level is going to happen sea level rise is going to happen sea level is going to impact inundation and it and a lot of people think about it in terms of okay the sea level is going to rise and then the land's going to flood and everything's going to change but it turns out what's impacting us on our time scale might not be what we really think about and the the impact of sea level and it might be more kind of interesting than you expect so sources of inundation for us tend to be mostly storms tsunami uh, extreme tides and then uh, wave driven events so sea level changes can change on many time scales but there's a sea level time scale that happens uh, you know, obviously everywhere in the globe, it's not as impactful uh, in some areas, but it's hugely impactful. And that's just the tides themselves, right? So the tides are sea level variability. It's a daily motion, semi-diurnal or diurnal, every 24 hours, or every 12 hours. And those can be higher or lower. And so what we, what we talk about with inundation is that if you have a higher sea level during an event, so you notice that these storms, tsunamis, um, super high tides and waves. These are all event driven phenomena, right? So this isn't just a long term trend in the sea level rising. What causes mostly inundation are these event driven things. And the impact, the point of this slide is that we're saying, hey, if I have more chances for a high sea level, because I have a smaller rise in the background sea level, but that makes all of my higher tides happen and a more repetitive or, or, or more chance of having more higher tides, then the more they have a higher chance of having a inundation event because you have a higher chance, a higher coverage of these higher sea levels. Well, well, let's look at the let's look at the we'll look at a slide that demonstrates that better than I just mumbled through it. So, and I like this one too. The the big event we aren't worried about. So, people are touting the sea level change or or you know it's huge dramatic changes in in climate or if you've seen some movies that depicted you know problems in climate um it it's probably not benefiting both either scientists or the population to think about it in that dramatic way because it's it's uh, it's actually maybe detrimental to what the impact's really going to be so i like this quote sea level rise is a storm surge in slow motion that never really creates a sense of crisis now people think that they're really worried about climate change and they have a sense of crisis but it's mostly like a um uh, it's either like a fear-driven thing or it's not it's not a you can't point to around the globe and say wow that was a huge climate change impact on society right there there's very few events that you can actually do that it's mostly what we were talking about before storms tsunamis flooding you know things like that um so sea level rise if i wanted to just point at it i'd have to sit out here you know for the next century and measure it every day and say oh yeah it rose you know six centimeters over a hundred years, and everyone would sit around and go, "Well, so what?" You know? So that's that's what I like to kind of, you know, it's it's a it's a big deal. It's a big thing. It's something we can measure, but it doesn't. The actual impact of it, or the actual reality of it, doesn't kind of get into our consciousness in the right way. So here's a great example. This is Majuro predicted tide maximum tides in Majuro by broken out into kind of yearly groupings. And um, this includes Majuro's background sea level rise. So just like the arrows that we saw in that big chart, this is one of those stations that has very accurate data. And we can do a very accurate tidal analysis of that data and show what the future astronomically driven tide plus the background sea level rise will be. And so this is the kind of plot that really makes the point. Oops, I jumped ahead because I didn't press the laser button. There was a big inundation event during this king tide period in 2014, the end of the black line. So that was when a large amount of wave induced flooding happened during a very high tide period. So they had a lot of impact in Majuro in that period of time. You can notice that during 2014, you have maybe one, two, three, you might call that actual event four, four high tides of a king tide variety at that level. The year before, there was none. 
nothing came up to that level. You move to the next year and you've got, oh, six or seven or eight. And in fact, we did have events during 2015. I just don't have pictures of them ready. And 2016, we've got six events probably. And then 2017, well, there's only maybe one or two, but as we go further and further along, so these are called natural tidal cycles. So there's, you know, there's four year, eight year, 16 year, there's long time period changes in how the tides work. So you can get maximal tides that are greater one year than they were the other year. But on top of that, we've got a natural sea level rise. So you come up here into the 2019, 2020, 2021. The chance of a high wave event happening during one of these very high tide events now becomes much greater. So without much sea level rise happening, their threat is increasing at a, at a geometric rate rather than just an added rate, which is extremely, um, you know, it's very important if you live in one of these atolls, and we'll get to that. So that's what I mean why increasing sea level can have other impacts because of the mechanisms of inundation that aren't directly due to the one or two centimeters of rise. And here's a picture from that event. So we actually had our product working at the time. So Pacayus was predicting. So this would have been at the time of the event and looking ahead two days, we said, wow, this would have been a severe flooding event. And in fact, when it happened, you can see that there was complete overtopping of the atoll during that event. So, you know, if you had a house there or, you know, you were in the area, it's just absolute, you know, disaster. Moving ahead. And then there's another event. So <clears throat> this is Roy in Kwajalein Atoll, 2008. Same, same kind of event, but it flooded over multiple tidal cycles. And you'd think that, well, just the flooding over would have been the displacement, you know, people's homes have to go move to a shelter, there's trash everywhere or whatever. But that's not the real threat. The real threat is if you get enough overtopping and standing salt water, the freshwater lens of the atoll gets contaminated. And this happened in Roy in 2008, and the military had to bring in desalination plants for six months until that freshened up. You can imagine that if an atoll if there's a slight change in climate and there's less rainfall and an atoll gets flooded over, it might not be habitable anymore. So, I mean, some of these atolls are approaching this kind of, you know, problem where in the near future, they may become uninhabitable. <clears throat> Another great example of this small changes in background sea level impacting large areas can be seen in Florida. Florida's got a, a big threat for inundation. So, in this chart, we see, whoops, I keep pressing the wrong button. I want the laser, give me the laser. These red zones are areas where the water table is within a foot of the surface. So that means their fresh water table or brackish water table is within a foot of the surface. So those areas are gonna be experiencing greater pressure from sea level rise. And here's why in the next chart, you see a little sketch of the geology of Florida's aquifer. And you can imagine that not only, so if you go down at the bottom where you've got, so they, they live on a whole limestone aquifer where water can move around quite easily. If you raise the ocean level a little bit, you can imagine that the salt water intrusion underneath their fresh water table, not only does it start to push in from the seaward side, but it also starts to fill up from the bottom, especially as they pump out fresh water. So they've got a double problem of, you know, removing the fresh water, but then the ocean wanting to come in and have pressure on those zones. So you could get a lot of different problems. You could get an increase in the brackish water in areas of habitability. You could also get, because fresh water is a little less dense, wants to float. Those areas that are within a foot, those are gonna flood. They're gonna become bayou, you know. So Miami Beach is gonna be a swamp, you know. So that's another another impact. So th this, is, this is due to both just slowly rising sea level, but also every high tide that has a maximal pressure pushing up more water into this zone causes a greater influence, even though you don't have rapid increase in sea level, you have an increase in the maximal sea level. And then this shows what I talked about before. 
uh, geology of atoll has that additional risk where same thing happens. You've got intrusion from the sides, brackish water pushing into the freshwater lens. You've got vertical intrusion through the uh, either coral or volcanic areas. And then you've got the problem that if it does flood, this whole lens becomes contaminated and it just becomes inhabitable. You, you don't have, there's no more water to support um, you know, habitability. And so let's talk about Honolulu, which is nice to talk about. This is kind of, okay, I had to use this slide because I like the color better. Um, but we're only going to talk about the very lowest kind of green blue. So this slide particularly is more um, what would happen during a hurricane. So these are, these are basically the elevation levels where kind of storm flood water will get to. But I want to talk about these green zones because that's, exactly the same kind of thing that could happen like like what's in florida or you know these green zones aren't very high above the the, the water level and in fact less than two feet so if you get an increasing number of high tide events and they're coupled with high wave or high storm activity you get increasing inundation and as soon as you get to the point where you're having you know severe inundation every year then it becomes a societal problem, right? And already we have products that predict what the inundation risk is for the Waikiki area. And I didn't even know this until just recently that one of the biggest users is of course hotel groups and stuff. But the reason they're using it is because it actually tells them when, uh, when their basements and the parking areas are gonna flood. And I was like, oh, wow. So it's pressure, not just pressure from overtopping beaches and put the sandbags out, like the picture I showed in the first slide, but there's actually pressure on uh, infrastructure due to these flooding events. And it's just when we have a confluence of higher sea level and a wave driven runup. And then that's, this is a good picture that we use all the time. So this is Waikiki Beach, completely flooding up to the top of the berm, sandbags that aren't working as the water floods into the bars. You know? <laughs> and all the people standing there trying to chase their shoes and towels and everything. And then here's an example of the product that we have for these areas. Um, you can go to the Packaius website and we have right now wave runup forecasts for Waikiki, the North Shore, uh, Majuro and Kwajalein. And we're hoping to extend this in the future. It's all a uh, kind of research in flux. The idea would be to be able to do this for every coastline. Right now, it requires us to go out and do long-term experimentation, put out a lot of instruments, you know, measure a whole bunch of stuff, and then come up with these calculations. And we really want to switch to being able to do it all by uh, computer modeling. So that's where we're kind of, we have an academic push to, to do this and extend this to other zones at this point. And then the final thought I want to do, because I, I kind of preface this by saying this is all based on uh, perception of time scales. What, what inundation impact really means to us is what's going to actually happen in our lifetimes and in the future, near future in general. So to kind of put perspective on that, this is a <coughs> really interesting. This is the coastline of Holland, 1850, 1950, and 2000. And in that time, they went from having a huge long coastline and installing a huge dike in the in the late Victorian and World War I era, recovering all of this landmass, the blue that's in the center from the 1850 is gone in the 1950. And then after that, they have another huge dike system that then recovers the southern, um, what it looks like a bunch of inlets and stuff huge land mass recovered in there. So in the span of 150 years, um, uh, a society, a government, you know, recovered massive amounts of land that's now put to use for farming, for towns, for whatever. And, and that's in that time scale, they basically dealt with inundation in, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, human engineering and, and reacting to your environment. Now that stuff will all of course come under threat as the sea levels rise in another 200 years or 300 years when their dikes aren't capable of withstanding the sea level rise. But again, it was all put in place in the order of 150 years. So 
<clears throat> I'm not trying to make it a plus or a minus. It just it helps us, I think, to put it in perspective when we see like a newspaper article about you know everything's going to be flooded in ten years or something. Well, probably not. You know that might be a little alarmist, but we are going to have to react to more flooding. You know, not even just in an atoll, but if you live in Miami or you live in Waikiki, you're going to have to start to react to more flooding. As a society, we should start to think about well, what do we put our efforts to do? Well, we should put our efforts towards you know reacting to these things and creating a better environment for society to exist in if we are concerned about those types of threats. And that's the end. If there's tiny, tons of any questions, I'd be glad to, uh, you know, attempt to answer them. <laughs> I have a question. Sure. The two oceans, the two major oceans are at different levels. Is one side or the other having more problems with this sea level rise? When you hear about the, the um, Small Pacific Islands and then shows Miami. So, just fantastic question. So, the question is the sea levels in different ocean basins are different. Now, let's start with gravitation. This is interesting, right? So, you go out to where there's like the Marianas Trench, there's actually a huge dip in the sea level. Like, it goes down. You mean right now? Yeah, the ocean just goes down because there isn't enough stuff under it, you know, or it rises up. As the as the gravity pulls the water closer, so the gravity the, the water around Hawaii is higher because there's more gravity due to more mass from the islands. So the contour of the ocean is actually just fixed geologically due to gravitation, which is an interesting problem. You know? And I think I don't remember. I think it's in the Indian Ocean. The deepest kind of the uh, the deepest pit is like I think it's like 60 100 meters. So, but if you're driving on a ship, you'd never notice because. You're just following the contour of gravity, you know. So, so the ocean absolute fixed level is different everywhere. Then, what you're kind of more alluding to is the fact that we have uh, constant current structures in the ocean. So, the sea level will be, you know, changing de depending on what the pressure is and its dynamic forces. So, there's currents that move around. Those currents are following. Higher or lower pressure, so there's a lot of different things that impact what the sea level is dynamically. So yeah, no, there's not going to be a big spillage of one ocean basin to the other. Really, it's not a problem unless you blow up Panama. Along the coasts, is it going to impact Pacific Islands more than East Coast cities? Or I think every region will have its own threat due to sea level rise. Places like we were looking at Holland, the tides there are immense. So they already experience a lot of variability every day. Small sea level rises don't impact them, except for what we talked about. The highest high tides will go a little bit higher every single time. Out in the Pacific, in some of these atolls, the tide range is very low. Like here, we only have about a meter. Our tides aren't that big. So small changes in sea level can actually start to impact us pretty quickly because we're not used to that kinds of change. So yeah, in that sense, for sure. Yeah. Uh, so Antarctica is surrounded by like um, current and it keeps cold water in it makes like a separate ecosystem from the other current people close to each other. What's going to be the global warming result on the current there? Because, that, because yeah, like the air and the water is Right, different. that's a fantastic question. I mean, that's one of the primary interesting areas that we need to do a lot more research in is, is the Antarctic circumpolar current. And so the question is, what's going to happen if there's any changes in that current or whatever? So that current is very interesting. It actually has three separate fronts. So there's like three different currents that go around. And each one of those can do different things. And it's really quite difficult to move heat across that boundary. So in our, our, our century-like time scale, the next 100 years or something, it would be very difficult to see major changes in the core of Antarctica. But if you change the current structure in the other ocean basins and either stop the water from going down and filling up or cause more cold water to go down and fill up in the basins, then yeah, that structure, that current's going to change. So we don't really know. I do know on a, uh, 
on a million year type cycle. Like if you close off the Drake Passage, then you get whole different whole different thing and you can have you know warm you know beachfront property in Antarctica. So. Yeah. Observations. Um, your focus has been on uh, flooding impacts of uh, sea level rise. Maybe that's important. But uh, the other impact of sea level rise is on uh, wave action hitting eroding beaches. And in terms of the uh, relative human scale short term, we're say the 85 years to the end of the century. Uh, in that 85 years, the sea level rise predicted just the low level of prediction of three feet by the end of the century is going to cause some pretty significant changes in the potential erosion of the shorelines of uh, Waikiki, uh, Kahala area, East Honolulu coast. Uh, all around the islands, there's uh, significant changes that uh, are probably more immediate and, and more impactful than, than the, the three feet of sea level rise. So, and that's uh, both of those effects are being uh, analyzed uh, under contract from the state. DLNR and Office of Planning is part of a study that's uh, going to be submitted to the legislature in 2018, which uh, hopefully will give some recommendations as to what needs to be done about sea level rise and coastal erosion. So, this, so the, 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 the observation was brought up that erosion is a huge part of this, which is absolutely true. So let's just talk about Waikiki, which is interesting. Alawai Canal was completed in the 30s, so less than 100 years ago. Beach morphology of Waikiki before that was uh, rocky, you know, brackish water, lots of swamps. So with, in less than 100 years, our human activity has completely changed that whole region, right? So we adapted to something that was already there and changed it. And now that change is going to come under additional threats, you know. So, that's why I talk about these time scales. So for sure, erosion is going to be a huge part. And another thing that, that erosion, why it's so such a big deal is when we say that the highest high waters in confluence with storm surges or these other events, those actually, those event driven things are what cause the worst amount of erosion. Those things can actually break through areas and like in an atoll, if, a, if one area gets a breakthrough, then it causes the circulation and the changing patterns of how the atoll functions and the whole ecosystem changes. Same thing can happen along our shorelines. As the sea level starts to increase, and we get these changes in, in uh, you know, shoreline morphology, we're gonna have areas that just aren't gonna be habitable, or we're gonna have to do a whole bunch of work to do it. So this, those are things we definitely have to face, and we should be facing. We should think about it and, and, and plan ahead. On the flip side, in less than 100 years, we change the whole of Waikiki and turn it into a huge tourist area, you know? Well, I, I think and that actually segues to the second comment I wanted to make, which is Dutch, which is you point to are the gold standard of how to deal with the problems of water. Um, not only you know, have done what you showed there, but they've already looked ahead 200 years and have their second Delta Commission that's looking at what they need to do. Interestingly, Part of it is letting the water in to fill some of those places that they that they uh, have, have blocked off. But in in terms of why and Waikiki in particular, uh, there's some things that people should be aware of. The business improvement district for Waikiki was given the power to do beach replenishment, uh, and they have recently commissioned a study by the universities in the planning program, I forget what the name but it's called Pre-Disaster Resiliency Planning, and it's looking at what the impact of all these extreme events would be on Waikiki 
and attempting to come up with something that would be a plan for, or what would you do in anticipation of those changes, and what would you do after those happen? Rotterdam's approach on this, I think, is is the optimistic way of looking at it because it can be all boom and doom. Oh, it's going to be 30 feet, and we'll all be blah blah blah. But Rotterdam says, you know, we've been dealing with flooding, we've been having to change to deal with flooding for years. So changes now, but we need to respond to it. And we can see change as an opportunity to make Rotterdam a better place. So we should be thinking about, well, how should Waikiki change to react to this erosion, to this flooding uh, that's going to happen in a way that makes Waikiki a better place? We're not there yet, but there are people at all the levels, federal, state, County that are looking at what that means. Then we were there. The engineers were saying, "Oh, it's just an engineering problem." The politics are. Oh, we're scared to talk about this. The, the 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 other thing to keep in perspective, like political will, ability to respond to it, that all changes as our society changes as well. So, I like I like to think about these societal time scales. There's a great cover of Time Magazine that I keep in my computer folder and it's 1974 and it says global ice age imminent will the cooling trend continue and if you take global temperature from 1945 to 1972 it's dropping significantly and at that point my colleagues the best climate scientists in the world were saying that we're facing the coming ice age you know and so I think, you know, I think we have to keep it in our heads to plan for these things and be resilient. Like resiliency is the name of the game right now, but we also have to keep a realistic uh, perspective on, on time scales. You know, it's definitely, that's, that's my, that's my theme, time scales. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.